Hello and welcome to NDTV Profit. You're watching Talking Point, and our case for chat today is: Will the Fed cut interest rate uh, in 2024? Uh, what is the outlook on Indian markets post-election? And in foreign fund flows, it's India versus China. And joining me today is Harold Wanderlind, who is the head of equity strategy Asia Pacific at, at HSBC. Uh, Harold, thank you very much for, for joining us on NDTV Profit. Uh, my first question to, to you is on the Fed rate uh, uh, that uh, happened yesterday. Uh, what is your view? Uh, will the Fed go ahead with the first rate cut in 2024? Yeah, well, thanks uh, for having me on, uh, on your show as well. Um, if you look at inflation just over the last, say, two or three years or so, you basically see a very nice increase and a very nice decline. And the, the numbers that we see now suggest there's a continuous decline. So, yes, they uh, I think they will be cutting interest rates. Um, now, the timing of that is then going to be important. That's what you're asking for. And I suspect in the second half of the year, they will, uh, will, they will have to do one cut. What normally happens is that when they start cutting, they will continue to cut. So normally, um, I expect this to repeat itself again. They will wait until they're very sure they need to cut, and then you see successive cuts coming through. Uh, but if you look at the overall trend in uh, inflation numbers in the US, um, I, I think um, I think there's no doubt in mind, actually, that, uh, that they're going to lower these interest rates. And uh, second half of the year is, is a good guess. Well, that's easy to say. It's June at the moment. But um, let's say um, from September onwards or so. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you look at the inflation numbers also, which came in last evening, uh, we've seen inflation to be very sticky. Uh, in the month of May, it, it, it uh, hardly moved. Uh, so do you yeah. see inflation heading lower from here on for in the next couple of months for the Fed to take the first de decision on rate cut? Yeah, I, I think, of course, they will be looking for further confirmation that these numbers are going to go down. But overall, I think the direction of travel is, uh, is in my view, fairly, uh, fairly clear. Um, but um, uh, you're right. Inflation in the U.S. has proven to be quite sticky. And I think there's a lot of things going on. There's a shift, for example, in the structure of the economy. Services are doing, for example, manufacturing. Um, it seems like strength in the U.S. economy has simply caught us a little bit by surprise. Um, it's been stronger, therefore employment has been stronger, demand has been stronger, and these sort of things that that's helped us, um, uh, uh, that, that's, that's made that inflation number a little bit more, uh, more sticky as well. So um, um, that, that is absolutely right. But if you, again, if you look at the trend of last, let's say, what is it now, uh, 12 months or something like that, um, it, it looks like every time it's moving lower or stabilizing, but it, it doesn't look like it's moving in the opposite direction. So I think the direction of travel is clear, but the, the speed at which the, the inflation number is going to come down is uh, yeah, it's slower than anticipated, at least than what we anticipated at the beginning of the year. You're absolutely right. When do you see actually a directional, uh, you know, commentary coming from the Fed with respect to a lower rate? Because today the bias is towards ensuring that the inflation is managed well. Uh, they're not worried so much about the growth because growth is coming in. Uh, but as far as the rate cut is come, uh, is there, uh, it's more of a bias of how to manage inflation. So when do you see that commentary changing? Uh, because uh, normally the Fed starts uh, early commentary before uh, you know it actually takes a rate action in either direction. Yeah, I know that's right. So at the moment um, they, they've put themselves kind of on a, in a holding pattern, um, and I think they just want to get a clear indication that inflation numbers is getting to levels where they start to think it's moving towards uncomfortably low levels. So if, for example, we see uh, that could either be that we see successive declines or we see maybe in the next month so a big decline or something like that then um i wouldn't be surprised they say oh, we, we really need to start cutting rates they need to see that being confirmed in, in in other areas as well the problem in the us is at the moment that simply demand outstrips supply that there is the over the overriding economy demand side employment these sort of things is just doing pretty good um and that shows signs of slowing, but yeah, uh, that's that's a, that's a real slow process. So I think they're looking for real evidence. The worry is, of course, if they go too early, and the inflation numbers 
pop up again or uh, again be very slow in responding to this and therefore don't go down so 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 quickly then um, they might be seen by the market as being uh, yeah pulling the gun too early and that that, that dons their reputation so um they, they're right in what they do in that sense i think they're waiting for clear evidence the market at the beginning of the year said oh you need to be very aggressive and you need to cut interest rates uh, five six times this year uh, clearly the market had to recalibrate its own expectations and storyline uh, as well so it's good that the um, but the Fed didn't just listen to the market, but um, kept on hold in the, in the first half of this year. Mm -hmm. uh, back in India, you know, we had the elections and we have the results out and uh, mm. uh, the government uh, is back in power with uh, mo almost all the key ministries with the leading party, which is the uh, BGP. Uh, how do you see uh, the flow of reforms from here on? Uh, do you see some kind of change or focus changing for the government going ahead? No, I think, um, first of all, the, the win, I think, for India was a good win. It, it, it creates a sense of uh, political stability, but also uh, not at the expense of the reform momentum. Um, what we're expecting to see at the moment is broadly a continuation of the sort of policies that have been put in place for the very simple reason that it's the same party and leadership is still in place. However, that there will be a shift probably towards more focus on welfare spending. We've seen a kind of disjunction between rural recovery and urban recovery in India, urban recovery being very strong, rural recovery being much lower. Um, so um, something to, to, to deal with that particular imbalance is probably important. And some sort of welfare spending or whatever that might be, we'll have to see in details, but that's, I suspect that's going to be uh, on, on the cards. And uh, is, is that uh, spending well within the uh, macroeconomic framework which, uh, or the glide path which was, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, provided at the time of interim budget, uh, is, you expect that to remain there, the glide path of fiscal uh, uh, discipline, uh, or is it going to uh, some way, uh, you know, change or alter that? No, I think I, I would be very surprised if this would go at the expense of fiscal discipline, that they do this in a very disciplined way. Why so? Because in the past, they have um, they've gone out of the way almost to show that they are very disciplined about spending uh, programs, not overspending, uh, not rumping up the, uh, the budget way too far and, and these sort of things. Uh, India might have well learned its lessons from the past. If you run a significant budget def deficit, that, that, that can be in itself much more costly than the benefits that such an um, aggressive budget uh, uh, generates. So they've gone out of their way to make sure that they've, they, 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 they put that discipline in place. So I would find it a kind of odd or unexpected if they would move in the opposite direction uh, at um, at this moment. So I don't think that's a particular working assumption for us. So more welfare spending, but probably um, um, limited in that sense. And or maybe they have to resize some of the priorities and think, OK, we're not going to do this, but we're going to do that. Um, and these sort of things. Uh, one of the... Uh... Uh, big things which is there is the earnings growth for the for the Indian companies uh, has been growing at uh, over 30 percent uh, in the uh, in the last quarter. Uh, how do you see the earnings growth momentum uh, going into the next financial year? Uh, do you see that to be sustainable? That to be sustainable? And uh, when you couple that with the fact that in India also there is an expectation of a rate cut happening at some point in time when inflation comes into control, uh, how do you see the Indian rate cycle? Also playing out yeah well let's start with the with the rate cycle first i think across the whole region all central banks are watching what the fed is doing there are other countries uh, philippines is a nice example where um it looks like inflation is going to come down they probably have quite some room to cut interest rates but are they willing to do so at the moment not because the currency is weak and uh, if they are too early and the fed is not doing anything that might exacerbate the situation so a lot of countries are like the philippines uh, uh, india has no exception to that they probably would like to cut but uh, they don't want to do that before the fed is doing it because the risk is if you do that that the Fed is later, your currency is going to be weaker, and then imports inflation, and it's going to upset uh, upset things. So um, they're all waiting for the Fed to move. But in regards to earnings growth, is the 30% earnings growth that came through in the first quarter sustainable? No, I don't think so. That will come down. 
But is high growth sustainable, meaning anywhere between 15 to 20 percent over the course over the next, uh, let's say, uh, three years or something like that in India? Yes, I think that is much uh, that, that, that is quite achievable because the drivers of the underlying growth are structural in nature, but also not dependent always on policy. We have an inflow of investments. We have uh, a development of urban uh, consumption taking place. We have the benefits from better infrastructure investments over the last, say, five, six, seven years coming through. And most importantly, they've seen a cleanup in the banking system. The MPLs are down. So the credit costs are down. The, 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 the ability to extend loans by banks is also much better. All of that will, at some point in time, taper off. These are kind of one-off things that, that, that really boost growth, but at some point in time, taper off. Um, but I suspect that will take a few years uh, before that really materializes. So is, is good, healthy, uh, 15 to 20% earnings growth possible uh, over the next three years, if, if that we call sustainable? Yes, I think. Is the Q1 number of about, say, 30% or so sustainable? That's probably a bit too high uh, to ask for. Mm -hmm. uh, if that's a scenario, uh, what is the, what is your take on various sectors within the uh, within the economy? Uh, are you moving uh, away from some and uh, you know entering new? Because we saw some sectors like the FMCG and others been lag uh, been laggard last year, but we saw some kind of revival coming in. Uh, if you look at foreign flows, uh, you know foreign flows have been uh, foreigners have been exiting so some of the financials there uh, it has seen some kind of revival with, uh, with respect to flows and you know the run up which we saw so where do you see various sectors within the economy here yeah so it you're right uh, seen a bit of a revival because the underlying and this comes back to what we said about the us economy is doing better than what we initially anticipated everybody was talking about a recession in the us 12 18 months ago that has just not materialized so that's um, that's good um, if interest rates go lower, that's probably not so fantastic for the banks either. But um, I do think that the banks look reasonably OK. Uh, the thing with India is it, it's not so much growth. We see decent growth in quite a few sectors. But um, the problem is really valuation. Certain sectors are really expensive. So I'd like to go down the valuation yield uh, curve a little bit, if you want to call it like that. Electro sectors where growth is OK, but the valuations are reasonable and banks fit, uh, fit into that. Um, one sector where valuations are really high, but again, the growth is highly visible, is the consumer sector. Um, it's probably one of the most interesting sectors in the region, uh, but Indian consumers in general. But yeah, it is it is uh, it is pretty uh, pretty pricey, and I don't think that is going to change. But that plays into all the different themes that we spoke about: eh? the better infrastructure build out that allows for businesses to grow and employment, better consumption. You see formal retail gaining market share over informal retail. The inflow of FDI is good for employment as well. Again, that is good for consumption. So, you know, a lot of these long-term drivers for Indian growth at the moment all come together in in the consumer sector. So, yeah, no surprise that that's rather expensive. So, I would be fairly selective on that uh, on that particular front. Mm -hmm. uh, two sectors uh, that I want to discuss with you is IT. You briefly spoke about the fact that US is recovering, so you're going to see some kind of recovery happening in IT. Do you see the earnings uh, also improving for some of them because guidance have been very muted for them for the coming year. Um, we saw volume growth been very low for many of them. Uh, do you see that because now that you are you're seeing a strong growth, growth in services side and some bit of recovery in manufacturing in the US, uh, you're going to see some kind of uh, order flows and growth coming back to some of the Indian IT company? Yeah, so basically um, for the IT sector, the old, the, 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 in so far they sell it, particularly the ones that sell into the US, probably have expected that the US will be in a recession now and that uh, business will be very weak. That has not materialized, that has not happened. So therefore, uh, uh, that underlying business is okay. The, the currency is weakened as well. That means actually that their US dollar business has been repriced to a certain extent in uh, in, in rupee terms. So that, that has helped them as well. And I think that is driving that particular sector at the moment. But if I look 12 months out, um, most likely that business will slow a little bit. Um, so uh, um, I, that, 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 that it remains a risk to that uh, particular sector. Um, so it's a sector that I structurally like, but I think it's had a nice rally. Um, um, I think I'd maybe prefer the banks a little bit better at this, uh, at this particular point in time. 
and uh, we're talking about uh, the IT sector before the break. Uh, I want you to, you know, touch point with some of the consumer sector. You, s you still said, uh, you know, you continue to believe that it's still overvalued, but many of these companies are high growth companies, high margin companies compared to the regional uh, peers and competitors. So, uh, what is it that uh, you know, uh, you know, makes them still very expensive? And uh, where do you see uh, I idly flows coming into these companies, or when do you see the flows coming back to these companies? Mm -hmm. I think the reason why a lot of people think that they are expensive is because of their good growth. And I don't think that is the case. I think the secret to success, particularly in the consumer sector in India, is distribution, the capabilities to distribute. If you come in as a new player in, in India, you want to set up a business, that's not easy. And in particular, getting your product across the country is very, very difficult. Um, the Indian consumer markets is geographically uh, much more diverse than, for example, the Indonesian or the Chinese consumer market, where most consumers are located in a few large cities. Um, so uh, India's, the difficulty in, in building out a consumer business in India has got to do with distribution. Being able to get your product to all sorts of smaller towns and literally having people on a bicycle bring it from, from one town and one village to another one. Now, if you can do that, you can become incredibly profitable. And I think this is the success to the high profitability of Indian consumer companies. They are the most profitable companies on planet Earth, simply. I mean, you have companies that are basically more profitable than, than um, I mean, the ROEs, 60, 70, 80%. That's higher than most of the AI companies in the US or Asia that people are looking at these days as well. So those incredible levels of profitability and the ability to generate cash flow uh, um, uh, that should be rewarded and that is rewarded in markets and that's where the high valuation comes from so um, it's not necessarily the growth but really the profitability and cash generative kind of nature of these businesses but yeah the valuations are high and this is what you therefore see when when it comes to foreign investors they always say uh, we like the indian story we don't have to talk about this but isn't it really expensive so what that happens is they think it's expensive rightly so the pe's are very high price to book levels are high. but the moment it comes down you see them coming in so although we've seen outflows from the indian equity market actually mutual funds um they are buying on the dips in uh, in in india i think mutual funds are much more smarter than foreign investors because one uh, they have a real uh, retail investors putting in money there uh, nearly uh, two to three billion dollars coming in every month uh, through SIPs, through the mutual fund route coming in. Uh, and that's uh, preventing uh, these companies from correcting so that the foreign investors can come in here? Yeah, I mean, um, domestic uh, firms are buying up uh, the equities um, uh, through these SIP plans, the plans that you just uh, referred to. That's right. You see this across the whole of the region, actually. Domestic investors, Asian investors are really buying into Asian equity stories. So it's not just India, but we see this in Thailand. We see this early sense in Indonesia. China has happened already, Korea, Taiwan. But in India, it is quite a impactful force, partially also because a lot of retail investors are unable to bring all of their money outside of uh, India. Most of it has to be invested, reinvested in India. So, um, yeah, domestic buying is very strong, and that crowds out the foreign investors uh, who say, well, it's too expensive for me, I'm out. So the domestics are buying it up and are less price sensitive, and that is another reason why the Indian markets uh, are expensive. Um, but as I said, um, uh, that comes also with good profitability of these companies. So, um, uh, yeah, and it's so creating it, a fear of fear of missing out as well. There, are, um, I think maybe sometimes the fear of missing out um, that happens very often if markets are really rallying very quickly. People are wrongly positioned. Most foreign funds are well positioned in India. Um, so it's not that they're fear of missing out. But if the Indian domestic investor continues to crowd them out, you get a situation whereby the foreign say, well, it's very expensive. But if this market continues to perform, I need to get exposure to this. I've been sold out. I need to get back into this. That, that could well happen, yeah. Another sector which is seeing a lot of, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, discussion and uh, where the clash flows are now emerging because that's a, a into maturity stage is the infra space where the money cash flows have started coming in whether it's sports roads or sh uh, sh uh, you know or any other infrastructure which is been put up uh, do you see that uh, f 
uh, foreign investors would be more interested in those companies because uh, now they've reached a maturity or uh, where cash flows are much more predictable and uh, you know growth is much more sustainable. So when it comes to infrastructure build out, I think uh, what I see in India is something that I saw 15 years ago in Indonesia. I was in Tamil Nadu a couple of months ago and I took a trip. Um, I like temples, so I went to see a bunch of temples, Tanjavur and places as such. Uh, what happened is that you're on a highway, but you drive for maybe 10, 15 kilometers on a the highway. Then you have to get off and you get through the paddy fields and stuff like that, small roads, until you get another segment of the highway that have been constructed. So a lot of that infrastructure is not really being built out. So that means in the near term, it's good business for the construction companies, construction companies, the infrastructure companies that can uh, the, the, that have to put these roads in place. But what we've seen in other markets is that the way to play this is actually through the consumer sector or the services sector, because the moment these railways are done, more business is going to go around, more trucks, you need more restaurants, you need more hotels, uh, all sorts of new businesses enter there. That means also factories can go to a new location that creates employment in that new sort of town that is now better connected to a highway system and these sort of things. That is one of the key stories that's unfolding in Indonesia, for example, at the moment. And I suspect that's what we're going to see in India over time as well. So the way to play this, I think, is really, yes, at the moment, some of the infrastructure companies and construction companies will have good order flow. But really, it's the consumer companies that are operating in these business, in these areas and geographies that are much better connected in, 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 in no time soon, um, that will be the real beneficiaries, uh, be beneficiaries of this. In all this, uh, Harold, um, how do you look at fund flows? Because we've seen... Uh, you know, HSI, uh, HSEI, you know, jumping the most, uh, nearly 38% year to date, uh, more than 30%. You have the CSI, which is up more than 13%. Indian markets have not rallied that much. And we've seen flows moving towards China. Uh, even after a lot of flows going to China, China is still at a lower average, uh, you know, uh, uh, lower than the five-year average in terms of valuation. Uh, how do you see flows between India and China? You have a growth yeah. story here, uh, you have, uh, but there is an issue with valuation in some of the uh, pockets there. At the same time, you know, uh, you have China where uh, the growth story is not that much. It's more supply, uh, oversupplied uh, story there. And there is no, uh, you know, the earnings growth is not as, as much as India, India growth. Yeah, the, the core problem in China is oversupply. Oversupply means you produce more than you consume. There's a lack of consumption. They, uh, there's just not enough. Uh, they try to export, and this comes with all sorts of other problems as well. And if you can't export it, you're going to lower your prices. So that's why you get a sort of deflationary sort of environment in China. And that means also that they can lower interest rates. That's the story in, in China. What we've seen in China, that rebound that has taken place, is really driven by a large extent uh, to a repositioning of funds. They were very negative on China since the beginning of the year. Then there was the realization that the U.S. pension funds, which publicly had stated that they were going to reduce exposure to the U.S., that their selling had stopped. That took, yeah, uh, uh, selling out of the market, and suddenly people thought, hey, this market can suddenly rally a bit, and there you go. They have uh, repositioned themselves, and that allowed that market to perform. Um, but in my conversations, and uh, in, 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 say, for example, in China, but also in Taiwan and Korea, is that a lot of people are looking at that, but they also bring up India as well. There's a tremendous interest, for example, in, in Korea, but in, in Taiwan on uh, in Japan on, uh, on, on Indian equities. So I think the fundamental story in China is very difficult, but people were wrongly positioned and needed to rebalance. They've mostly done so. The fundamental story in India is much healthier, but that is well priced in. So we've seen a near term sort of reshift of focus. But if it comes to the next two or three years, I think a lot of a lot of people would be more comfortable with their investments in India than in China. Um, we like both markets, actually, but this is, I think, the general sentiment. So have we seen some flows from India going into China? I think maybe not as much as you think. I think there's been money coming out of Japan and some of the other markets also from outside the region that has gone into China. Yes, we have the suspicion that hedge funds have sold down India to buy uh, China. However, if we look at the long only mutual funds, a lot of them actually have increased their weighting in, uh, in, in, in India. 
So these people have sticked with, uh, with India. Mm -hmm. uh, so between these uh, Asian countries uh, where the fl uh, flows are moving, uh, how do you rate India uh, and how do you rate China? At the moment, we like both markets uh, for, very, for, for, for very different reasons. China is cheap and uh, well positioned, but has massive challenges. So when you're taking a tactical view on it, India we like for more structural reasons, as I mentioned earlier on. Um, uh, I don't really have, therefore, a big preference of one over the other. If you would say to me, uh, I put my money in the market now and I want to invest politically for uh, the next five years or something like that, then I would say, hey, maybe India, the story looks a little bit better and there's more uncertainty to the direction that China is taking yet. So uh, then, then, then I would have a small uh, preference for it. But rating wise, we like both markets uh, at this moment. Finally, uh, Harold, uh, what's the one risk that you see investing in India or in China? The one drift, you mean the risk? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's always sorts of risks, the geopolitical risks and these sort of things. I think the risks lie maybe uh, with the equity investor in India. I think it might well be we've had a nice rally and companies have performed very well. Um, we got to be careful that some of these valuations don't run away from ourselves. So in India, we had a big rally in small and mid caps last year. Uh, the stock exchange came out and said, listen, that's fine. You can buy these, but just be very careful. They they made some warnings. And I think that's very good that they did so, because sometimes you get this kind of uh, fear of missing out. As you mentioned earlier on, people want to participate in something and put money where maybe in the long run it's not so wise to do so. I think so. Um, sometimes in India, you see this sort of exuberance taking place in certain sectors. So we have to be a bit careful with that. China, the risks are very different. The risk is simply that they need to put policies in place to deal with the overcapacity. And at the moment, um, yeah, that's a bit difficult to see how they're going to address that in the very near term. So uh, well, we have to get more signals on that front. But that is the ultimate problem in China, a lack of demand. I would, uh, the risk is maybe that they're not doing too much on the demand side in, in China. Uh, Fair enough, Harold. Uh, 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 it was a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you very much for joining us Thank on you. NDTV Profit. Uh, you are watching Harold van der Linde. Uh, he's the head of equity strategy Asia uh, Pacific at HSBC. Thank you for joining us on NDTV Profit.